Spoiler warning for Avengers Endgame. Give up, Thanos. You're finished. We're tired of your memes. They're as good as dead. I mean, they're on Facebook now. Fine. If this universe can no longer appreciate Thanos car memes, then I'll start a brand new one that will. No! Were you expecting something to happen? I, uh... I was kind of hoping I was worthy of Mjolnir and I could just kind of summon it? Wait, hold on, I'm getting a text. Stop calling me. I will not help you fight. I thought I made that clear last Thursday. Awkward. Internet. Welcome to Film Theory. We're not America's ass, but we are the ass of YouTube. So there's no denying that Avengers Endgame was full of a lot of instantly iconic scenes. Tony's snap, the Ant-Man taco sequence, Fat Thor. But in a movie full of awesome moments, none, not one was as thrilling as watching Captain America using Mjolnir to fight Thanos. Just to paint the scene, since we don't fully have access to the footage yet, Thor is attacking Thanos with Stormbreaker when the tables suddenly turn. Thanos is pressing the axe closer and closer into Chris Hemsworth's chiseled bod. Or, I guess, beer bed bellied bod in this movie, when out of nowhere, Thanos is knocked away by the hammer. Pull back to see Mr. America's ass wielding Asgard's mightiest weapon, and all the lightning powers that come with it. Ah, it is so good! Even though we can't show it since the home version isn't released yet, just talking about it with our little animations here is still getting me hyped for this scene. But after getting me hyped, it then got me curious. Who else could wield Mjolnir? Mjolnir is, after all, a weapon that judges a person's worthiness, so who else in this enormous cast of characters could make the cut? Should Hawkeye be trading in his bow? Could Black Widow have finally found herself a decent weapon other than gun? Or maybe, just maybe, Thanos could have wielded the hammer for himself. By looking at Steve and Thor's actions across these movies, and when they can or can't lift the hammer, we can start piecing together where Mjolnir's threshold of worthiness lies, and from there, judge whether anyone else would pass the test. The best place to start when it comes to defining worthiness is, of course, the original Thor from 2011. When the movie begins, Odin is bragging to Thor and Loki about how he heroically defeated the Frost Giants, and then pulls the greatest jerk move of all when he reprimands Thor for wanting to do the same thing. A wise king never seeks out war, but he must always be ready for it. A wise king also apparently hides his warmongering past behind centuries of propaganda, but don't worry, that won't become important for another two movies at least. Flash forward a few thousand years from that opening scene, and Thor is about to be crowned king of Asgard. Thor makes three vows during the ceremony. He swears to guard the Nine Realms, to preserve the peace, and finally to cast aside all selfish ambitions for the good of the realm. So that already starts to outline the criteria that we might end up working with. During the coronation, frost giants attack. Thor throws himself a hissy fit that his coronation was interrupted and swears vengeance on the frost giants. You are a vain, greedy, cruel boy. You are an old man and a fool. Thereby breaking his oath to defend the Nine Realms. Odin doesn't take it all that well. You realize what you've done, what you've started? I was protecting my home. You cannot need to protect your friends. How can you hope to protect the kingdom? You are unworthy of these realms. It's pretty obvious why Thor would be deemed unworthy here, and he spends most of the rest of the movie depowered back on Earth. It's only after Thor recognizes that violence isn't always the answer, and he chooses to willingly sacrifice his life for Earth's safety, that Mjolnir suddenly deems Thor worthy once again. The hammer flies to Thor in his dying moments, and he's back into fighting shape, which is kind of an odd message, but okay, it tells us two major things here. In the eyes of Odin, Sorry, in the eye of Odin. Worthiness requires you to only use violence as a last resort, and it also requires you to be willing to sacrifice your life for a greater good. The story of Captain America actually supports these two qualifications as well. No one can doubt that Steve's intentions are pure throughout his movies. He's fighting in World War II to stop a force of evil and ultimately protect the people, and by the end of the first Avenger, he too has made the ultimate sacrifice. He gives up his life to protect others. This is 
why, even as far back as Age of Ultron, Steve was deemed worthy by Mjolnir. Look back on the hammer lifting scene from that movie. It is one of the best moments in the entirety of this franchise. Not only is it hilarious, but it's also a pure distillation of each of these various characters. Tony is trying to outsmart Mjolnir with technology, Hawkeye is just kind of lost in this world of magic and superheroes, Banner plays off everything as a joke. The entire time, the hammer refuses to budge. But when Steve tries to pick it up, we see it move. Ever so slightly, but it does move. Back then, I think most of us wrote that scene off as Captain America almost being worthy to lift the hammer, but not quite being all the way there. However, looking back on the scene now that Endgame has happened, the truth is clear. Captain America could lift the hammer the entire time. He just played it off like he couldn't in order to not stand out above the others. As director Anthony Russo himself confirms, quote, in our heads, he was able to wield it. He didn't know that until that moment in Ultron when he tried to pick it up, but Cap's sense of character and humility, and out of deference to Thor's ego, Cap in that moment realizing he can move the hammer decides not to, end quote. Quote. That's why in Endgame, Thor calls out. I knew it. Thor, like us, suspected that something else was going on, but couldn't be 100% sure until it actually happened. And in hindsight, it actually puts an even more interesting twist on this moment from the first Avenger. You don't give up, do you? You could have the power of the gods! Choosing not to pursue the power of the Tesseract in that first movie is a big reason why Steve is actually able to access the power of the gods by the time Ultron and Endgame roll around. And this is back in the first movie! God, I'm just really blown away by little details like this. It's really impressive. Anyway, the moral here is that power is granted to those who don't seek it out. Cap being worthy all the way back in Ultron may also explain another key moment in the franchise. Remember what Odin says, Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, he shall possess the power of Thor. So really, Cap, from the moment he touches the hammer, is working with the power of Thor. So maybe that's how a normal human like Steve Rogers would be able to hold back Thanos' fully stoned gauntlet at the end of Infinity War. It's just a thought. And yes, I know that the co-writer of that movie, Christopher Marcus, said it was because Thanos was dumbfounded at the brazenness of Steve thinking he could hold back a titan. But that's kind of dumb. It was totally the power of Odin. That is my personal canon now. Anyway, this all brings us to the main question of the day. Who else could pass Mjolnir's test by the end of Endgame. Surprisingly, it's more than you might think. Let's start off with the obvious one. Tony. The Tony Stark who appears in Endgame is a far cry from the Tony Stark who failed to lift the hammer back in Age of Ultron. At the time, he was arrogant and selfish, but his overconfidence is something that he largely loses in the wake of Ultron's destruction of Sokovia. Just like Thor's time on Earth taught him humility, Sokovia taught Tony that others were suffering because of his actions, and that he needed to be more responsible. But even at the end of that movie, he still wasn't worthy because he was selfish. It wouldn't be until Infinity War that Tony would actually overcome that other barrier. Him hopping aboard Thanos' ship was him giving up what he loved. Pepper Potts for the good of Earth. He didn't anticipate coming home from that trip. Yeah, he backslides a little bit at the beginning of Endgame, but by the time of the snap, he's back very solidly into the worthy column, sacrificing a perfect life with his family for the greater good. Which honestly makes his sacrifice that much more unfortunate, since as we saw at the end of Thor, the power of Mjolnir can actually bring those on the brink of death back to life. So instead of that prolonged tearful goodbye with Peter and Pepper, they should have just given him the hammer and revived him. But they didn't, and now he He's dead. Moving on, Natasha Romanoff, aka Black Widow. When she's first given the chance to try lifting Mjolnir during the Ultron scene, she declines it by claiming, That's not a question I need answered. Well, maybe not you, Natasha, but we all do. Now, admittedly, Natasha has a spotty past of assassination and murder. I got red in my ledger. But when you actually look at her behavior throughout the MCU, she's done nothing but selfless acts her entire life in an attempt to atone for her mistakes. And even those past mistakes weren't really her fault to begin with. She was kind of forced into them multiple times. As she herself says in Endgame, I used to have nothing, and then I got this. This job, this family. I was better because of it. Her commitment to self-sacrifice for a greater good is ingrained in her character. In Winter Soldier, she exposes Alexander Pierce's evil schemes, knowing that, in the process, she'll also be exposing her own crimes, which will then force her back into hiding. She then signs the Sokovia Accords because she believes that the heroes do need to be more accountable, but then she goes on to help Captain America in his own personal quest to find justice, which causes her to again have to adopt status as a fugitive. So basically, in 
Civil War, she's giving herself the worst of both worlds, all in pursuit of helping others. Even on her normal missions, she's willing to lay down her life. Five years ago, I was escorting a nuclear engineer out of Iran, but the Winter Soldier was there. I was covering my engineer, so he shot him straight through me. As for the other half of worthiness, Black Widow doesn't actively choose to fight, and even warns those who are more worthy than herself against entering battle. You know what's about to happen. Do you really want to punch your way out of this one? And like I alluded to earlier, she is a weapon that was created by other people. She didn't choose this life. This life chose her, and she's trying to make the best of it. And all of this, of course, climaxes in her moment of ultimate sacrifice for the Soul Stone in Endgame. So would Black Widow be worthy of holding Mjolnir? Yes, a hundred percent yes. She has more than redeemed herself, and would absolutely be seen as worthy in the eyes of the Hammer. She was probably worthy as far back as Age of Ultron. The brilliant part here, though, is that she's not worthy based on her own standards. The choice to have her not lift the hammer in Ultron showed that external signs of worthiness don't matter to her. It's more about how she feels about her own character, which is, again, sad, since had she tried to pick up the hammer and been successful, she would have seen that she's not as irredeemable as she thought. I had this dream, the kind that seems normal at the time, but when you wake, it's true. That I was an Avenger. That I was anything more than the assassin they made me. And that, again, is what makes these movies so awesome. Strong, emotional theming. Adding yet another level of insult to injury is the fact that if she hadn't sacrificed herself for the Soul Stone, her plus Mjolnir would have been a lot more useful in that final battle against Thanos than Hawkeye. I mean, Hawkeye just runs with the gauntlet and then hands it off to the evil Nebula. Good job there, buddy. And because of your murder spree as Ronin at the beginning of the movie, there is no chance that Clint is passing muster. Meanwhile, Black Widow plus a godlike hammer? Add her to that girl power shot, my friends. Speaking of girl power, what about another strong female from the series? During an interview with BuzzFeed Brazil a few months back, Brie Larson made the claim that Captain Marvel was definitely worthy of Mjolnir. Do you think Captain Marvel is able to lift Thor's hammer? Definitely. Are you sure about that one, Brie? I think you might be getting strength confused with worth. Sure, at the end of Captain Marvel, she's doing her best to roam the cosmos protecting the helpless, but Captain Marvel hasn't shown herself to be self-sacrificing. She arrogantly believes that everyone, including Thanos himself, is no match for her. Because before you didn't have me. If she doesn't see there being a threat in the first place, then it's not much of a sacrifice for her to enter the battle, is it? And that's actually kind of my problem with this character so far. There are no stakes in a fight that she has no concern about winning. But that's not all. She also tends to resort to violence very quickly. Clearly, she holds a personal grudge against the Kree at the end of Captain Marvel, outright challenging Ronan the Accuser during the final space battle. Her method of punch first, ask questions later, isn't going to be earning her any quality hammer time. So no, Brie, I have to disagree. Speaking of strength and sacrifice, we can quickly eliminate the Hulk as well. Losing to Thanos didn't make Hulk humble in the slightest. If anything, it made him more arrogant than ever before. Say green. Granted, this isn't really disqualified qualifying on its own, but you know what is? Hulk's motto. Hulk smash! Not really the phrase of someone who's gonna be using diplomacy first. Even when he snaps using the gauntlet in Endgame, he still thinks that he's gonna be fine. He specifically says, It's like, I was made for this. Indicating that his best guess is that he would survive. Not much of a sacrifice, not much of a pacifist, not so worthy in the eye of Odin. Which brings us to the grand finale, the third and final snapper. Perhaps the most interesting name to consider on this list, Thanos himself. You may remember last year when I made the outrageous claim that Thanos was right. So is it possible that Thanos is in fact worthy? I mean, sure, he's treated as the villain of these movies, but in principle, his mission seems solid, even if it is a bit misguided. He's going around planet to planet, wiping out half of all life to help those who remain. He doesn't want what happened on his home planet to happen to anyone else's. It is, in his mind, a noble mission. And based on what we've seen about how the hammer works, worthiness isn't about being right or wrong, it's about intention. How pure is your desire to help? Based on what we see, you can make a strong case for him meeting our two criteria. First, self-sacrifice. In pursuit of his noble mission, Thanos shows himself willing to make the hard sacrifices for what he perceives to be the greater good. He sacrifices his greatest love, his own daughter Gamora, off the cliff. We see him gravely injured after using the Infinity Stones not just once, but twice, making him so weak that he's finished off without trouble at the beginning of Endgame. In a way, he is repeatedly making the ultimate sacrifice of his 
his own life as well as the lives of those he loves purely to achieve this goal of helping other people in the way that only he knows how to do. One clip alone sums this up best. What did it cost? Everything. As for avoiding violence as a first resort, yeah, you could argue that he does this too. In Endgame, he sits around and waits until all the other heroes attack him. He doesn't seek out the violence, he lets it come to him. On an even bigger scale though, he just sits around on his floating space throne and waits for literally the entire series, only choosing to step in to fight when it's clear that no one else is going to be able to help him accomplish his mission. But perhaps the biggest point in his favor is that once he accomplishes his elimination of half of all life, he stops. From what we see on Gamora's home planet and on Earth, Thanos only pursues violence insofar as it's necessary for the task that he sets out to do. Could he have killed more people? Absolutely. But he doesn't. At least he doesn't until they continue to bring the fight back to him. Where did that bring you? Back to me. It seems like even the movie's editors knew that this was the case, considering that, in promotional materials for Infinity War, Thanos says, Fun isn't something one considers when balancing the universe, but this does put a smile on my face. Which would seem to indicate that he does get some joy out of this process. But the line was cut from the final release of the film. For being a warring titan, Thanos is shockingly reserved. And again, this cannot be overstated enough. When he gets control over all the Infinity Stones, he has the power power of the universe in his hand, he still doesn't use the stones for his own personal gain. He doesn't use them to kill needlessly. He uses them once to help everyone, and then he uses them again to destroy them so that no one can undo his actions. That is it. Even the choice of him using the stone to accomplish his mission is a point in his favor. Look at how he describes it. With all six stones, I could simply snap my fingers. They would all cease to exist. I call that mercy. It's a clean way of killing. It's not violent or painful. Like he says, it is a merciful way to go. He's clearly thought this through for the best interests of everyone, all those who live, as well as all those who are gonna die. So is Thanos actually worthy of wielding Mjolnir? While there's a great case to be made for Thanos, there is one final consideration. He's helping people who aren't looking for help themselves. Sure, his goals may be noble, and yes, he may only commit as much violence as he needs to in pursuit of that mission, but he's also also imposing his will on others without their consent. They didn't ask for help, and yet Thanos comes storming into their planet to outright tell them what to do with extreme actions of violence. Is that the definition of worthy? No. No, it's not. This would be the deal breaker. At least, it would be the deal breaker for most people. But remember, we're not worried about most people. We're worried about one person in this franchise in particular. Odin. Odin is the one who cast the charm on Mjolnir, and this whole time, we We've been asking, what is worthy in the eye of Odin? It's easy to forget that Odin himself, like Thanos, was a conqueror. Odin subjugated the Nine Realms because he too thought that it was an act that served a greater good. According to Hela and Thor Ragnarok, he slaughtered untold amounts of people to achieve this goal. Has no one been taught our history? I was his weapon in the conquest that built Asgard's empire. One by one, the realms became ours. It was only after he finished his task that he decided to become a peaceful king, Thanos' quest actually falls into the same territory. Be violent and be hated while you're taken over, but retire and let those who remain be peaceful after it's all over. As Thanos himself says, The hardest choices require the strongest will something Odin would be inclined to agree with. So is Thanos worthy of Mjolnir? I would have to say that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, yes, he is worthy. In most people's definition of worthy, I'd say no, but based on the evidence that we see across all these movies, as well as the morals of Odin, the man who made the enchantment in the first place, Thanos is within the bounds of worthiness. He should be able to lift Mjolnir. Maybe that's why he's able to stop Stormbreaker in the final endgame scene. Maybe that's why it doesn't end in the way how it should have ended proposed, with Thor launching the hammer at him and just perma pinning him down. It actually opens up a lot of really interesting avenues. But now he's dead, without realizing that he was worthy in the first place, just like Natasha and Tony. Man, if only people had stopped and asked themselves this question before they got into a climactic final battle. Hindsight is 2020, which is useful in the Marvel Cinematic Universe considering you have a time stone that turns things backwards in time, so bring back Thanos, and Black Widow, and Tony, and let them wield the power of Thor. It would be so cool! A three-way battle royale with the hammer. If you make that happen, Disney, that is the thing that'll get me to subscribe to your new Disney Plus subscription.
subscription service. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut.